Welcome back to Logic 101, I'm William Spaniel, and today's topic is proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction, sometimes known as an indirect proof, is a really useful proof strategy, not only for sentential logic, but also for mathematicians and game theorists like myself. I probably use proof by contradiction once a week or so. As a result, it's really important for you to understand what's going on here. This is the idea behind proof by contradiction. Imagine that you're in a situation where you want to show that P is true. Maybe because you're working on a problem set that's asking you to show that P is true. Or maybe you're working on some dense mathematics and you have a suspicion that P is true, but you really want to prove that it's the case. Well, as you're going through your proof using the tools that I've given you previously, for whatever reason, showing P directly as you would have normally given what you know currently, for whatever reason, you just can't do it. It's really difficult, and everything you throw at it is just hitting a wall and it's not working. Well, proof by contradiction gives you an alternative mechanism, an alternative strategy to figure out that P is true. So rather than show that P is true, you instead show that not P must be false. And if you have not P as being false, that's like saying not not P, and through double negation, you therefore has, have P as being true. So the way you go ahead and operate a proof by contradiction is as follows. You begin by assuming that the negation of what you're trying to show is true. So we want to show that P is true, and instead we're going to assume that not P is true. Then we're going to continue the proof as we would normally, using the exact same rules and proof strategies I've given you previously. And what you're trying to ultimately do by assuming that not P is true is derive an explicit contradiction. Something along the lines of Q and not Q. That's a conjunction of a statement and the negation of that statement. That can't possibly be true. And if you've done that, you have therefore shown that P must be true. And here's why that works. Our rules, the tools and strategies and general ideas on how to write a proof, everything I've told you so far in this course is truth preserving. It takes things that are true and spits out other things that are true as a consequence of those things that we originally knew were true. Well, if we get to something impossible as being true using our rules, it can't possibly be the fault of our rules that we've arrived at something that is impossible as true. And so if it's not the rules that are at fault, the only other suspect thing that we have out there, the only other thing that it could possibly be, is the assumption that we made. And so the assumption that we made must be false, and then that's how we get to showing that what the original statement was that we were looking for, P, is true. So if that seems a little bit abstract, let's look at an example, and this will clarify things. Imagine that we have two premises, P or Q, and Q implies not Q and we want to show that P is true. Well, the way we're going to start off a proof by contradiction here is by assuming that the negation of what we're trying to show is true, is true. So the negation of P is simply not P. So that's going to be our third line, and we're going to call that an assumption for proof by contradiction. Notice that I've indented this a little bit. Usually I would have everything flush to the column line right there down the, the first uh, line, well, you know, the second column, you know what I mean. I'm not going to go into detail. You know what I mean when I'm talking about we would normally have it flush. This is a little bit indented. And the reason that it's indented, you'll see in a moment. What's going on here is that anything that we use in a proof by contradiction, we can only use it for the proof by contradiction. And so we're sort of placing it on its own area, in its own column, indented column, so we know that it's just for the proof by contradiction and not for anything else. So if we've assumed that not P is true for our assumption by uh, for proof by contradiction, then we get to use not P as we would normally. It's just like it's a true thing, just like it would be in any other proof. So we can use lines 1 and 2 and line 3 all the same on this indented area here. And so if we have line 1 saying P or Q and line 3 saying not P, then we can get, using disjunctive syllogism, Q as being true. And again, we can use that information just as we would normally. So if we have on line four that Q is true, and on line two that Q implies not Q, then through modus ponens, we have line five telling us that not Q is true. 
Well, if we have lines 4 and 5 there, you'll see that we've arrived at the contradiction that we were looking for. We have Q and not Q as being true. That's ridiculous. That is a complete contradiction, and so that seals our proof by contradiction. And when we seal our proof by contradiction, we finish by declaring that the negation of the assumption for proof by contradiction is false. So we get that not not P as being true, and that's through lines 3 and 6 of a proof by contradiction. And you'll notice that I've killed off the indentation there, and that's because we're not assuming anything anymore that uh, may or may not be the case. We, in fact, know that not not P must be true through the proof by contradiction. And so to finish the problem, we have double negation right there, and you get to line 8, P as being true through line 7 using double negation. Done deal. Good to go. So there's an example of proof by, proof by contradiction. When you're using it on your own, here are the rules for using a proof by contradiction. Uh, first, you're going to indent all lines of a proof by contradiction, just as you saw. And that's because anything that you get on a line in a proof by contradiction is coming as a consequence, perhaps, of the assumption that you made to start off the proof by contradiction. So we're going to indent all of those lines to represent that fact and clarify to us that we can't use those lines in the future once we're done with our proof by contradiction. You're going to end all proofs by contradiction with a contradiction, something along the lines of Q and not Q. So you'll ordinarily be proving each one of those things individually. So you'll have to show that Q is true or not Q is true. And again, Q could either be a simple sentence or a compound statement. But you're probably going to, most of the time, have to prove each one of those things individually and then conjoin them together for your last line of a proof by contradiction. The next line after a proof by contradiction must be the negation of the assumption of the start of the proof by contradiction. That's because you're trying to show that it can't possibly be the case that the assumption is true, and you're getting to that by the contradiction, so you get the negation. You're saying that the assumption of your proof by contradiction is false, and that's why you're doing, or that's why you have uh, rule number three right there. Rule number four says that all proofs by contradiction must be closed before the proof is finished. The overall proof is finished, is what I mean by that. You can't just have a proof by contradiction going and then uh, at some point just stop and say that you're done with the proof. The proof by contradiction has to be closed in order for the proof to be finished. And that's because, again, when you're indenting things, you don't know those things are true. You just know that they're true as a result of the assumption that you made. And so even if you have in that indentation some line that says P is true, that doesn't mean you've actually shown that P is true. You've just shown that P is true based off of the assumption that you made by the proof by contradiction. So you can't actually get to something as being true overall, absent that assumption that you made, until you've closed that proof by contradiction and you're finishing without any indentation. And then once you've closed your proof by contradiction, you can't use any line from the above proof by contradiction. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So imagine that for whatever reason you decided to show that not Q is true. You can't use lines 2 and 4 to justify that. So on line 2, we have Q implies not Q. We can use that all we want on this indentation level, all the way flush on the left. But what we can't use is not Q on line 5. Uh, uh, rather, uh, no, line four, excuse me. We can't use Q on line four to get to not Q on line eight through modus ponens. And the reason that we can't use that Q on line four is because we only got to Q being true in this instance as a result of assuming that not P is true. And once we've closed off this proof by contradiction, everything that we assumed in that proof by contradiction and everything that we derived as a result of that assumption, we just don't know whether it's true or not anymore. The only thing that we know is true is the negation of the first line of the proof by contradiction. All right, that wraps this up. As I said, proof by contradiction, really, really useful. So we're going to be seeing this often. This won't be the last time you've encountered it or you're going to encounter it. We'll talk about it a lot more. Hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time. Take care.